Good morning and welcome to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV Big Fox. I'm your host, Frank Aikum, and we are broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio here on Marcus Street in Corning. We've got a couple quick comments I want to read. Our guests are here. We're going to be talking with a town a candidate, excuse me, for Town of Corning Supervisor Jennifer Mullen and Town of Corning Council Member. Uh, Stuart Samus, who is running for re-election. So that's coming up in just a moment. If you have any questions for our guests, there is our contact information. You can text, leave a voicemail, or email me at any time during the program, after the program. I'd love to hear from you. And we heard from a few people yesterday. So let's get to those comments before we kick off with our guests. First up, I don't know a lot about Mike Johnson, the new Speaker of the House. But I very much enjoyed his words and only hope the actions to follow will back them. Time will tell, but in my opinion, he hit a nerve, a big nerve, by the expected backlash. So he must be doing something right. I didn't hear anything that wasn't factual, but the left loves to spin things and beat the MAGA narrative. And that's what we talked about yesterday. MAGA was the term used uh, consistently. But MAGA narrative drum, because the more you tell a lie, the more the uninformed accept it as truth. It becomes a serious problem when we normalize this nonsense. So it's imperative that we speak the truth and back it with the facts. So thank you for that comment. I'd love to hear your take on Mike Johnson, kind of a, well, not someone that a lot of us were familiar with. I'll put it that way. And here's the second comment. This one I love. Here we go. I'm hearing mainstream media only has a 7% approval rating. That's not a, a shock. I have a 100% approval rating for, frankly speaking, the mainstream news alternative. I love it. Thank you so much. I Yeah, 7%. That's a low bar that they've set for me. Uh, <laughs> the mainstream media, of course. Well, how do you trust them? Uh, you, you really can't. Uh, that's what we've talked about so often on this program is the mainstream media. A lot of it is what they don't tell you what they don't report on. But we can't get into all that because I don't want to wait. I, I don't want to keep our guests out in the cold any longer. So stay with us. We will be right back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV. Big Fox, stay with us. Welcome back to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV Big Fox, broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio here on beautiful Marcus Street in Corning. I'd like to thank our guests for being back on the show. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having us on Of again. course, of course. We have a lot of questions. Your race is coming right up. Can you believe it's already here? Yeah. No. November 7th. I, I cannot believe it. It's literally right around the corner. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I have a little countdown in my car. <laughs> How's the campaign been going? It's been really positive. Good. Um, we've knocked on a lot of doors, sent out postcards. Um, on the postcards, it asked for emails, uh, Facebook, and lots of people have messaged, and I'm really grateful for the questions. Doesn't it seem that uh, people, even though it is local races coming up, people do seem very active this year? They do. They yeah. do. They seem engaged. Yes. Um, the questions seem engaging. They really want to know why they're choosing the person they're choosing, which is wonderful. Well, let's start off, um, well, I guess I already did start off, but let's start off with a question that I don't believe we got to last time, but just about yourselves, because obviously you've been knocking on doors, you've been talking to a lot of people, but you can't hit everybody. So let's Absolutely. talk, if you want to start. Absolutely. Um, Ladies first. Thank you, thank you. My background, I'm, I'm a nurse. Mm -hmm. I've been a nurse for 15 years. I teach at Cuca College. I'm an associate professor there. And I've been on the town council, Stu, five years? Six. Six? Six years. Goes fast. It really does fly by. Uh, we've done a lot of community work, a lot of engagement. Mm -hmm. In May, my opponent resigned unexpectedly mm -hmm. on no warning, and Mike Brenning has stepped in to cover that. And the biggest push I can give to people is in everything I do, I don't quit. Mm -hmm. I will be there. I'm solid. Um, with my academic background, I really want to write some grants, try and get funding sure. for the town and really try and have us solid financially. We already are, but we want to do better. And so I'll get to you in a second, but how do you think, because <laughs> you're running for a Town of Corning supervisor, how do you think that'll be different than your time on the council? The supervisor position really has the opportunity to open doors. Mm -hmm. We get to go meet with other towns, villages, and really do some shared service agreements. We really get to engage and present ourselves like we want to be seen. Mm -hmm. 
So it would be really be a great opportunity to get that shared service um, ability. It would be sure. a great opportunity to get some grants to meet other people and try and do really amazing things with the support of a great council. Mm -hmm. And Stu, you're running for re-election. How long have you been on the council? Uh, 12 years. 12, 12 years. 12 years, wow. So, well, no. let me ask you this way then. Why are you running for re-election? Uh, because um, I don't think the job is done. You know, a sure. couple of years ago, I uh, was wondering if I was gonna run again, and I, I went and I talked to uh, Bill Boland, mm -hmm. or as we refer to him in the Rotary Club, King William the <laughs> First, um, and uh, to, to, to get, get a, a feeling of you know why should I run again? And he asked me one simple question: Have you gotten everything done that you wanted to? Sure. And I said no. And he says, "There's your answer." Mm -hmm. And I think that's the same position I'm in right now. Mm -hmm. um, Jen will bring a breath of fresh air to the whole structure. Mm -hmm. um, she is very open, very transparent, as I think I am. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, and uh, unlike uh, her, her uh, opponent, um, there, there's a, a degree of dedication to the town that I think uh, has been lacking. Um, she doesn't try to pull punches or uh, shady, um, not shady, but uh, questionable sure. uh, acts uh, on things like uh, spending how, how to spend some taxpayer money. Sure. That's me. Don't worry. I'm the unprofessional one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we we got uh, we got the ARPA money, mm -hmm. and we had a shortfall in revenue for the courts, mm -hmm. which is a whole different story. Uh, and uh, her suggestion was, let's take a good chunk of that and do a one-time fix. Okay. Um, you know, as for myself, I I look to be very fis fiscally responsible. Uh, I've lived in. Corning for uh, 38 years. Huh. Um, moved around an awful lot before <laughs> that. As sure. I like to say, I was 32 when I moved into the house I live in now, and it's the 16th place that I live. Wow. Yeah. I uh, spent 25 years with Corning, raised three kids here. Sure. Uh, two, uh, all three moved away, two have returned, and the third is planning on returning. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And I want to, if you could move that mic a little bit closer. Oh, right? sure. That's what that text was about. Right. Um, but you had mentioned it there with your involvement with the community and you mentioned rotary so i think that's a good segue to talk about your community involvement because it's not just being on the council it's it's i mean that's a very important part of it don't get me wrong but it's also about the community in general right um so i did a lot of time working with the boy scouts uh -huh. uh, one of my sons an eagle the other one's a life scout um i am uh, been very active with my church um i'm a ruling elder uh, served on a number of committees. Uh, I am the president of the board of directors for the Cornell Cooperative Extension, mm -hmm. and um, been very active in Rotary. I'm the uh, immediate past president, which is a officer's position in the club, and um, I head up the um, community service committee. Um, I have started um, our community gardens, yeah. which. Um, has uh, planted, I believe it's seven gardens uh, over the last wow. seven or eight years, um, including um, one at the food pantry. Oh, great idea. Where uh, this year we're, <coughs> we're on track to have about 400 plus pounds wow. of food produced right there. It goes right to the clients. Great. Um, that's Stu's got a huge initiative with making sure people are well fed and taken care of. That's <clears throat> and that's, that is always seen in the council. He's always worried about everyone else. Well, now I'll uh, ask you the same question, your in involvement in the community. Uh, my involvement in community is I do a lot of work with the Corning Joint Fire District. Oh, sure. I've, I'm an interior firefighter, EMT, and work on community education, getting out to the schools, getting our message out for safety. The last thing you ever, ever want to see is somebody get injured, of somebody course. get hurt. Um, and we try and be there. When the call goes out, we're there. Um, I serve as an officer, as a lieutenant there. So it's a lot of fun. That's yeah. that's kind of my, my, call it my therapy, my fun. Um, I also serve on community gardens in Rotary with Stuart. Uh, we just put together a smoke alarm project with Rotary. So homes that can't afford smoke alarms, we've piggybacked with the Corning wow. Joint Fire District to get them free smoke alarms. 
which has been an amazing initiative. I, I have to say, Jen <coughs> drove that. She got the uh, club behind it to fund it. Mm -hmm. um, what was it, 200? How many alarms do you get? Uh, over 200. Wow. Um, and, but and there are not many left. Mm -hmm. so. and, and then also got the um, fire district uh, and three other fire departments. Mm -hmm. The three departments within right. the fire district, right. along with um, our regional partners, Corning City, tied in with us, mm -hmm. which again ties us into community and working together. So it was really able to cover more regional than just local, which is a benefit because we don't want to fire anyway. Right. Uh, of, cor of course not. Um, some of my other background is, again, Community Gardens, Rotary. We did that project together. And with um, the council, we've built one big playground up at Oakfield. We're updating the manor and trying to really put pieces in place where there's community events, things mm -hmm. for people to go to locally, and we really want to bring that to the town. So I, here's kind of, I don't know, this may be a difficult question, but one I think is important. What is your proudest accomplishment with your time on the council? Working together. Yeah. And I, I know that sounds so fluffy and superficial. Cliche. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I could say the parks. I could say building the website. Mm -hmm. I could say a hundred things. But when I started, I had this, this idea, this thought that um, everyone here just wants something for themselves. Mm -hmm. Right? And that was so not true. Yeah. It was how can we work together to build better projects? How can we do you know the best thing so any ideas I've come up with uh, th this board has been amazing has been absolutely amazing and I always say I come up with a hundred ideas yeah I would call Mike and say hey what do you think about this idea and be like okay princess well you know rein it into <laughs> one Stu would figure out how to pay for it yeah. and then I would call Lon who would give me the hundred questions an hour on the way home <laughs> of if you can't answer these I'm mm -hmm. still gonna ask them in a board meeting yeah but you have to be able to answer them before I can support you. Sure. And how amazing is that? Mm -hmm. How amazing is that? <clears throat> I just want to follow up on, on, with, with Jen. Uh, she's being a little on the modest side. Um, <laughs> a thousand just, ideas? <laughs> with, 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 no, I, you being modest is, is, is the unusual part of that. <laughs> um, she's anything um, but uh, conceited or self-centered. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. But um, she, she's sold herself short on working together. Mm -hmm. She brought us together, okay? We weren't dysfunctional by any means, but we more or less worked through the, the you know, went through steps, and sure. um, she's, she's been the leader, not the other person, uh, for, well, since, I'd say the last four and a half, five years. Uh, we had to get her over her um, <coughs> chip on the shoulder. My <laughs> chip on the shoulder, yes, yeah. yes, that's been removed. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you know, all these, all these dumb Republican men. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna this 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 woman Democrat is gonna show them, you know, how to do it. And, and now I've um, switched parties, which is another segue in. Um, I've received a lot of questions. Oh yeah. And I really want to touch base on that. Um, Sherry Crozier with the Republican Party reached out and said. You know, we would really appreciate having you come over. Um, we don't want to run anyone against you. You're doing a really, really, really great job. Mm -hmm. I'm still very middle of the road. You yeah. know, it's local. It's, it's local. It's, I it's think common that's, sense, mm -hmm. and that's a big, big piece. Mm -hmm. It's really about working together and the common sense. And we talk about that a lot on the program. That <laughs> of course, on the national scene, we all have the Democrat and Republican issues, right? But at the local, that's not what, you, when you're going into a council meeting, that's not what you're, th you're not thinking about national policy. No, I'm not. I, I, yeah, I, I guess I shouldn't have spoke for you there, but I didn't yeah. assume you would. So before we go, I have two questions. Uh, why should the voters vote for you? I am honest. Mm -hmm. I'm reliable. I have a lot of integrity, and I show up. Um, I guess the word relentless <laughs> has been used a couple times. Yes. Um, yes I won't has. quit. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing is my door's open. I'm not one idea. Like yeah. six years ago, I thought I was. I want to work with everyone to get the best outcomes possible. I know that, again, that sounds fluffy, but that's what I'm here for, is really just to do good things. I think, for me, it's um, my ability to leverage. Mm -hmm. um, the, go back to the community garden. Right. Right, the, the first one, the Kate Danforth garden. I was able to get the land that it's on. We're using town property that was un, underutilized, not utilized at all. We got help from the school district. Um, 
the we would call the shop class. I right. forget what they call it these days. Mm -hmm. They built the beds for us. Wow. The buildings and grounds crew went over, picked mm -hmm. them up, brought them over. We got materials that was scrap from the highway department to do for the bed liners. Uh, Rotary Club donated uh, $2,500. Uh, First Presbyterian Church g gave us $11,000 wow. over three years. Uh, got in with uh, the people from the food pantry, which led to us putting another garden in at the food mm -hmm. pantry. It's knowing and being involved in the community mm -hmm. that I think sets people like us apart from some other, because we don't just, I know these people, it's how can I work with them for the betterment of the community? Mm -hmm. So just before we go, what would you say to voters before the head of the booth on November the 7th? Come out and vote. That's going to be the big one. That is that yeah. is the biggest push. Um, I'm going to be making phone calls, knocking mm -hmm. on more doors. Thank you to everyone who's opened their doors, answered their phones. But please come out and vote. We really want to hear your voice, and it matters especially locally at the polls. It does. Yeah, and this is in <coughs> Chicago, so we're not going to do the yeah. Yeah, vote early. Vote all. <laughs> well, thanks so much. Best of luck. Thank you so much, Thank Frank. You. All right. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV. Big Fox, stay with us. Welcome back to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV Big Fox. I am your host, Frank Aiken, broadcasting live from the Hesselson Studio. Thanks again to our friends who just joined us, our interview. Candidate for Town of Corning Supervisor, Jen Mullen, and Town of Corning Council Member running for re-election, Stu Samus. Thank you for being on the program. We have a lot to get to locally, uh, obviously nationally, internationally. I wanted to start with this, and this is... I need to do more research, but I received this press release uh, yesterday, and, and I've got to admit, it, it was troubling, it bothered me, uh, because we've had friends on this program in the past from 4-H and from the Steuben County Fair. Well, according to this, Steuben County 4-H is finding a new showcase location and will not be at the Steuben County Fair. This is what they said, and I know this is very uh, local, but I'm sure you would want this update. On October 26th, the Cornell Cooperative Extension of Steuben Board of Directors and 4-H Program Advisory Committee had voted to part ways with the Steuben County Agricultural Society regarding their participation in the upcoming 2024 Steuben County Fair. This difficult decision has made after, was made excuse me, after substantial consideration and after several meetings, including multiple 4-H subcommittees, 4-H Program Advisory Committee, and the CCE Board, and with the full support of the New York State 4-H Program Director and Cornell Cooperative Extension Director. Regarding the issue, the following statement has been released. So this is just a quick story, a quick hyper-local story, but again, one um, that I think would be surprising. Quote, Steuben County 4-H, a program of Cornell Cooperative Extension, Steuben County, will have an opportunity for 4-H youth to showcase their hard work throughout the year at a local property that is safe, welcoming, and kind to all 4-Hers, families, visitors, and staff that allows the 4-H program to follow state and county 4-H rules and policy. This is currently not guaranteed by the Steuben County Agricultural Society at the Steuben County Fairgrounds. We recommend changes to the venue to provide equity between programs, exhibits, and shows, and a safe and inclusive environment that fosters positive youth development. We recognize the importance of the tradition and long-standing history of 4-H at the Steuben County Fair, which makes this a difficult decision. We understand and acknowledge that many of our 4-H families are unaware of issues with the Steuben County Agricultural Society and that this will come as a surprise. We must prioritize the safety of our program participants families and staff and feel that a change in venue is necessary at this time. So we'll try to get not to the bottom of it, but we'll try to get more information on that. I know that will come as a blow to many people um, because 4-H is kind of synonymous with county fairs, but specifically uh, Steuben County Fair. Uh, so if we get more information, we find out more, we will pass that along to you. Again, a quick hyper local story, but one that I know uh, you would find uh, interesting and thought provoking. Okay. Another, do we have time? Now, nah, let me take another break. I do want to mention this, though, uh, before we go to break. Uh, I've been, uh, I meant to uh, get to it yesterday, but we ran out of time. The show goes so quickly, as you are well aware. 
We received this from our friend Sheriff Allard just before we go to break, and I wanted to, again, pass this along to you as well. Steuben County is going to participate in the statewide Stop DWI Halloween. It's a high visibility engagement campaign, and that's running today through November 1st. Steuben County Sheriff Jim Allard announced the Steuben County Police Agencies and Stop DWI coordinators will participate in special efforts to bring awareness to the dangers of impaired driving. Quote, have a plan, get a ride, and keep our children safe this Halloween, said the sheriff. Now, if you look at the bottom of your screen there, download the mobile app, have a plan, and you will always be able to find a safe ride home. What a, what a um, amazing program. So there you see the website on your screen. And now it's time to take that break. Stay with us. We will be right back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV, Big Fox. Boy, look how beautiful it is on Market Street this morning. Welcome back to Frankly Speaking. Speaking of Market Street, we're broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio right there in the Gaffer District. Okay, um, before we get to, um, well, so many topics, um, Israel, we've got a couple things, updates on the, on the new speaker, uh, the presidential race, and, of course, the tragedy in Maine and the uh, politicians that are now pushing for gun control. But before that, Congressman Nick Langworthy has introduced a bill, the Energy Choice Act, and what this does, according to the congressman, is end the blue state wars on American energy. It's the Energy Choice Act, and it prohibits states or local governments from banning an energy services connection, reconnection, modification, installation, or expansion based on the type of source of energy to be delivered. Here is what the congressman had to say. Hopefully it shows up on your screen properly. There we go. Governor Kathy Hochul and Democrats in Albany are hurting upstate New Yorkers with a re relentless war on American energy. Her effort to ban the use of gas in buildings across the state will not only increase energy costs for families, but it will also eliminate a reliable and necessary source of energy that keeps homes heated and people safe during our extreme winter storms. And he's been very outspoken about this, the congressman, because he saw what happened in the Buffalo area with that really bad winter storm. And, and we've talked about this with Assemblyman Phil Palmasano as well. It's not hyperbole to say that these decisions by the governor and in those in Albany uh, will lead to death. When you lose, if your whole house is electric and you lose power, and many of you in the rural areas have, have experienced that, it's a very scary scenario, but now you would have no heat, you would have no way to eat. And then of course you have electric vehicles on top of that, which will not be uh, effective in that kind of snow, but I'll continue, I'm sorry. And this is becoming a dangerous trend in blue states across the country. The Energy Choice Act would end these costly bans and secure our nation's energy future. Uh, so I'm, we're glad to see that coming from Congressman Nick Langworthy. We appreciate the, the effort in this because for areas like ours, it is going to be deadly. Governor Hochul and the, the decisions made out of Albany on the energy policy. Okay, now to the national news. And in this case, international news, uh, the US military carried out airstrikes on facilities in Syria that were operated by Iranian backed forces. The US military conducted airstrikes on two facilities in Eastern Syria. This was yesterday in response to ongoing attacks against American military personnel in Iraq and Syria over the past week. And we brought this story to you yesterday about, or maybe it was two days ago now, about these um, Iranian-backed attacks on our military. A pair of F-16s targeted two facilities, a weapons depot and an ammo storage area. Um, and it was... Um, used by Iran, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and affiliated groups. That's according to a senior U.S. defense official, and they told Fox News, this is coming from Fox News, it's unclear if there were any Iranian militants at the facilities when they were hit. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said in a statement last night that the U.S. does not seek conflict, but the Iranian-backed attacks on American forces are unacceptable and must stop. Um, we're learning from the IDF now, 
And we're going to jump around a lot this morning because we've got a lot to get to. Please bear with me. Uh, and you can weigh in at any time. You see the number on the bottom of your screen. But the number of hostages being held in Gaza by Hamas terrorists has now risen to 229. That coming from the Israel Defense Force spokesperson. Friday's number is five more than the 224 hostages reported on Thursday. And the number is likely to change as various operations continue to unfold. John Bolton, uh, I know I mentioned this a lot, but uh, Dennis Miller used to have a radio program, the comedian Dennis Miller, and he would call John Bolton the nuclear walrus because of that mustache. But John Bolton claims that Biden has his hands around Bibi's belt, meaning Benjamin Netanyahu, um, not allowing Israel to move forward with military operations. In the Middle East in particular, they recognize strength, said Bolton. They talk about who's the strong horse, and we know in the region it's Israel. But, but Biden has his hand around Bibi's belt. They're not letting people go forward. We're going to talk about um, the rise in uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, well, I don't know if you say rise. It's just now so visual. There's not people hiding it, and it's, it's getting very, very scary. If you saw the headline yesterday in, um, in New York City, they were telling uh, uh, Jewish people there uh, to stay inside because there's going to be protests. I believe it's on Saturday. We're going to tell you, I think, a really, for lack of a better word, moving piece or a heartbreaking piece by John Podoritz uh, at the New York Post when we come back. But first, we need to take that break. So stay with us. And as always, you can weigh in at that number on the bottom of your screen. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking. <laughs> What a beautiful view of Marcus Street here in Corning. I wanted to remind you, I mentioned it yesterday, but if you would like to um, sponsor that roof cam, please feel free to reach out at that number on the bottom of the screen, or let me put up my contact information just for you in general. Or if you'd like to have your ads played uh, during the program, we have such a loyal viewership uh, that I think would be great for any business. So please contact us. And we have other sponsorship opportunities as well. So I mentioned this, um, and it is, it's heartbreaking because we, we're seeing anti-Semitism rear its uh, ugly head and uh, not hiding. Not, it's not in the shadows. John Podoritz at the New York Post said, rather than protecting Jews, we're being told to hide again. A day after Jewish college kids found it necessary to barricade themselves inside a library. Did you, did you hear about that story? It was at um, Cooper Union College in New York. A group of Jewish students had to take shelter in the library there as a group of demonstrators loudly chanted Free Palestine outside. It's got to be terrifying for these people. They're actually calling for the uh, Cooper Union Library or Cooper Union uh, president to be fired. Excuse me. She failed in her duty. All of these uh, schools have a duty to keep students safe, and these students are not safe. They do not feel safe coming back to campus. They are not here today. They're afraid to be here today because of what had happened. But I'll continue with John Podoritz's um, article. I just wanted to give you that background information. Um, so now it says here that the message is being broadcast that on this Sabbath, Jews in Brooklyn had better remain at home, stay inside, lock the doors. A pro-Palestinian protest is scheduled for 3 p.m. Saturday in front of the Brooklyn Museum. That's a mile from 7, uh, 770 Eastern Parkway, the headquarters of the largest ultra-Orthodox sect in the world. Roughly 20,000 observant Jews live around 770 in the neighborhood called Crown Heights. An ultra-Orthodox news site said, quote, Jews should definitely avoid the area. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, on the Sabbath, observant Jews do not use electricity or vehicles or screens of any kind. To pass the time on Sabbath afternoon, they often go for a walk. Not this weekend. And this is um, about four pages. You can find the full thing at the New York Post. But it's, it's, it's heartbreaking because he gives the history of specifically that area and past protests and past um, um, tragic events because of these protests. Not only uh, back in 1991, not only were 38 Jews beaten, seven Jewish owned businesses were looted and burned to the ground. So he backs this up with past facts from this exact area. 
Why do you think marchers are meeting near Crown Heights then? Because that happened in Crown Heights. This is why. Their purpose isn't to call for a ceasefire or to advocate for the Palestinian people. Their purpose is to make it known that October 7th, what October 7th, made known. There will be no peace or security for any Jew anywhere in the world if they get their way, these protesters. He, he wraps up, and I'll just go to the end before we take another break, but in my 62 years of life, said John Podoritz, I've thought every day of the blessing America has been to the Jewish people, a blessing unlike any my people have ever known. And this, the most Jewish city in the world outside of Israel, has been a blessing as well. At this moment, though, the Jews had better hide. I cannot tell you how terrifying this is. Heartbreaking. That, this, and that it's not in the shadows. This anti-Semitism, um, obviously, uh, it is prevalent. We've seen it in the media. We've seen it in pop culture. We've seen it from politicians. Well, for instance, did you see the California city, Richmond City Council? They're the first in the United States to condemn Israel. They accuse the Jewish state of, quote, ethnic cleansing in Gaza. And this one easily on the Richmond City Council. Do you, again, I know it's California, but does that prove the point that the city councils and town councils, it's important for you to vote? Yeah, I, I don't even want to read their statement. And then you have uh, on the political side of things, which is, this is really fascinating. Muslims are warning Democrats to lose their votes over Israel support. Quote, you're going to have a problem. Muslims warned the Democrats will lose their votes over Israel support. Some Muslims in Michigan feel betrayed by how Democrats have responded to the Israel-Hamas war and are warning party leaders they might not back the party in 2024. Now, this is really interesting. The reason I bring it up, because that means you have um, Muslims that are not happy with the Democrat party. Obviously, uh, we've seen and we've had quite a few stories on this recently about Jews that have said, you know, the Democrat Party has let us down because of this uh, streak of anti-Semitism. You know, uh, well, whether it's uh, being at pro-Palestinian rallies or whether it's uh, like um, Tlaib who demands, uh, doesn't believe our intelligence or Israel's intelligence, demands that we have a, um, an investigation into that bombing at that hospital because she just cannot believe she, she's her bias and her knee jerk is to blame Israel. And then there's a, that was one piece. There's another one. Democrats division on Israel Hamas war boil over in Michigan as Detroit area Muslims feel betrayed. This sounds like it could be a real problem. Well, it's listen, this should be a problem when it comes to the the anti-Semitism that we've heard uh, from politicians. Uh, that should be this is interesting because I don't know. I guess there was, uh, there's, they're upset that um, some of these politicians attended a um, pro-Israel rally. It, it, this is getting very, very tricky for the Democrat Party. So I wanted to end on that note uh, uh, for this topic. But please weigh in on all these issues and any other issue you'd like to. The 4-H situation we talked about earlier. See how much you get covered here, frankly speaking. We cover everything. Stay with international, 4-H, local races, and here in just a moment, national races too. So stay with us. This is Frankly Speaking on WYDC-TV. Big Fox will be right back. Thank you again for joining us here on Frankly Speaking on WYDC-TV Big Fox, broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio. I'm your host, Frank Aiko. I'm so glad you are a part of the program this morning. Hey, did you hear about the primary challenge against President Biden? Dean Phillips. Yes. Uh, you may not be familiar with him. Dean Phillips launched a primary challenge against President Biden. Well, officially, he's... Uh, going to make the announcement today, uh, but he teased this yesterday. I would say as a rule, I'm no expert in, in running for president. I would say to when you're making this announcement or at least teasing it, and you're going to, I guess, take this seriously, you're going to primary the president. I'm not sure I would start with this quote. Quote, I think President Biden has done a spectacular job for our country. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> so well, anyway, but he did say, but it's not about the past. This is an election about the future. I will not sit still. I will not be quiet in the face of numbers. They're so clearly saying that we're going to be facing an emergency next November. So his argument for running is not necessarily that Biden has done a bad job and that Bidenomics has been disastrous. His argument is, well, the poll numbers, people aren't liking the job that Biden's doing. Uh, and I don't essentially, I'm sure this is what it, if you read between the lines is, I don't want Trump to get in there. So I'm going to run to save the country, I suppose. Phillips is expected to formally announce today in Concord where he'll file to run in New Hampshire's Democrat primary. Now, this is interesting. The um, Listen, the, does he have a chance? Probably not. He's hoping that maybe it gets other people in the race too, so there is an actual primary. But the reason I thought this is kind of fascinating, Phillips' campaign strategy is already causing headaches for the party, Okay. Biden will not file to appear on the New Hampshire Democratic primary ballot because the state isn't complying with the nation or with the National Party's revised nominating calendar, which demoted its first in the nation primary status to second. Instead, Democrats will launch a writing campaign for the president. So that's what I find interesting. It's a smart move by Phillips, Dean Phillips, who is going to announce today that he's going to primary. Uh, Biden, if you're just joining us. So what he's starting in New Hampshire, because Biden's not going to be on the ballot. Now, you can write him in, of course. That's an interesting strategy. With uh, Phillips entering into the race, the uh, that effort will become that much more important to New Hampshire's Democrats, who would want to spare Biden an embarrassing early primary defeat. Yes, if you have an early primary defeat, it's going to be a very bad sign for things to come from the president, because that momentum goes the other way. So it's a very smart move from Phillips. Uh, Phillips has already reserved $50,000 in ad time in the state this week. Wow, that's according to data from Ad Impact. Now, Phillips is also being advised by former Republican strategist Steve Schmidt. Two people familiar with the campaign has said he, now he previously worked uh, for former President George W. Bush and the late Arizona Senator John McCain. So Dean Phillips has entered the race to primary the sitting president, Joe Biden. Now, if you're not familiar, again, with Dean Phillips, not I wouldn't say a household name. Actually, as a matter of fact, I haven't been good about putting my graphics up this morning. I had an article. There we go. I had an article just to show you if you're not familiar with Mr. Phillips. The congressman is the heir of the Phillips Distilling Company and co-owned Talenti Gelato. His run in 2018 for Minnesota's third congre uh, congressional district flipped the seat from Republican control. With a slogan of everyone's invited, Phillips calls himself an eternal optimist and a bipartisan believer. This is also an interesting point. So he starts off by saying, I think Biden's done a spectacular job. And then uh, The Guardian points out, there's a little difference between Phillips and Biden on policy. Phillips has voted with Biden's legislative agenda nearly 100% of the time. And you know who pointed that out? The White House. We got to take a break. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV, Big Fox. We are back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV, Big Fox. I, uh, Realize that we have to take another break here shortly. Then we're going to wrap up the program. I did want to quickly mention, since we talked about Dean Phillips running against Joe Biden in the primary, we know Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is no longer running in a primary, uh, but is third party. He is begging the Biden administration for Secret Service protection. We talked about this in the past. It's got a lot of reaction from you, the viewer, uh, wondering why would he not receive Secret Service protection. But add on top of that, an intruder has been arrested at his home now twice. Yesterday, an intruder climbed the fence at my home and was arrested, said Robert F. Kennedy Jr. After being released from police custody later in the day, he immediately returned to my home and was arrested again. Sounds like bail reform. I mean, it is, whatever they want to call it, there at his home, wherever he's based out of, Los Angeles property. So yeah, it's, it's catch and release. Not wrong, wrong, bail reform, that's what I meant. It's bail reform. He gets arrested, this guy, for breaking into Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s home, and then 
before the ink's dry on the paperwork, he's back out and back in Kennedy's home. So he's begging for Secret Service protection. This is very questionable with the Kennedy name, why he would not receive that protection. We've got to take that break. Stay with us. Then we're going to wrap things up with Frankly Speaking here on Big Fox.